Good morning, everyone. It's good to see y'all uh, this morning. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Uh, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. You pray with me. God, we know that you are holy and you are just far more amazing, far more powerful uh, than we could ever, ever imagine um, this side of heaven, Lord. So help us to uh, worship you, to offer acceptable worship, to be uh, in awe of who you are, to revere you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Yeah.
Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for this morning and this day, God, your mercies that are new every single day. We thank you um, that by your grace you give us breath, uh, so that we may glorify you now, while we're here, so that we can, we can live for you um, on, on this earth, God, at, at this time. Thank you for sustaining us, for providing for us, for being a generous God. Help us to just be in reverence and awe of you this morning and to hear your word and to be doers of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning, or at least somewhat with you. Uh, I just want to thank uh, this worship team. They are uh, really incredible and uh, very grateful for them uh, leading us in music this morning. If you have your Bibles out there, uh, you want to turn them to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, will be in verses 13 through 21. And as you're turning there, I know that uh, if you follow in the news and listen to the governor, that, that uh, things are, are slowly on the track to begin opening in Oklahoma, and, and the governor has uh, given uh, the okay for uh, churches to, to reassemble. And so he's kind of leaving that with uh, in the hands of, of the pastors and the leaders of the church to decide uh, when that takes place and do so with caution. Uh, and I just want to let you know, I, I've spent a lot of time praying about this, and, and as of right now, I, I don't have a piece of heart uh, in my heart uh, to just, you know, go back together just immediately the way things were. Uh, it's not because I, I don't want to be with you in person. I'm very much in longing for that day. I've, I've missed that. We should miss that. We should be, that's a good thing uh, if you're out there and you've been missing the, the, the corporate physical gathering of the body of Christ. My, 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 my hesitancy uh, is because of love and care for people uh, and, and, and not wanting to, to rush into things too quickly and possibly cause harm in someone's life. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to uh, be as, as wise in this as I can, uh, listen to, to experts. I've talked to a number of people in the medical field. There's a number of people that are... are, are thought that some of this opening may have been a little too soon. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and, and maybe this will go fast and everything's great. Um, but anyway, just, just to let you know, I am praying with that. I'm listening to that. I'm trying to come up with a, a plan of what com coming together might look like. We might have to kind of do it, do it slowly or in a process. And what that looks like for us, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but it is on the front of my mind, and I'm, I'm praying through that. So uh, 2 Corinthians 5. 13 through 21. I'm just going to read this passage. This is an incredible passage for us this morning. It says this. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let me pray. Father, Lord, if we open up your word together this morning, 
I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that you would enlighten our eyes. I pray that you would, uh, Lord, generate a, a response of our actions to who you are and to what you have called us to do. That we would, in light of what Christ has accomplished, in light of his death and resurrection, we would, we would live with the mission and purpose for which you have called us to live. Let this time be for your glory and honor. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. As we uh, talked about last week, um, we are uh, entering in just kind of a shorter series uh, as we are a part like this, and, and what we're looking at is really uh, the resurrection life, and in light of what Christ did, and, and two weeks ago when we celebrated that he, he rose from the dead, he, he defeated sin and death that has no, long, no, no, no sting to it anymore as we just sang about, um, what does that look like? What does that mean for us as people who believe that? And I hope you believe that. If you're not, then I'm imploring you this morning to believe that. Uh, what does that mean for us? Last week we saw that we're just resurrection people. And we kind of fleshed what that looks like. Today, this morning, we want to look at the resurrection purpose. What is our purpose? What is our, what is our, 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 our meaning? What's the meaning in our lives? What are we called to do? And I just love this passage. Because this, this passage gets to, to the heart of who we are as believers. And it gets to the heart of our purpose as believers. So this morning, I want us to see five uh, mission or purpose statements from this text about who we are as followers of Christ, as children of the resurrection. So I think this is, this is I'm just a, a man of five this, 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 during this series. I've got, uh, I think last week I had five points, this week I've got five points. And we're just going to jump right in. Number one, the first mission statement we see here is this. We put the love of Christ in the driver's seat. We put the love of Christ in the driver's seat. Look what it says in verse 13 again. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Now that verse, verse 13, is very interesting. And it is a much debated verse. Well, what is Paul talking about? Uh, the idea of the phrase beside ourselves is really out of our minds. Crazy, insane. And so Paul is saying that, 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 that uh, if, if we are out of our mind, it's, it's for God. Now, now, what's going on here? You, you need to put in this, this verse in a little bit of context. Uh, Paul is, is writing to the Corinthian church, and the Corinthian church is a little bit divided. Uh, in fact, if you read both letters, they're very much divided at times. And, and, and one of the, 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 the main reasons of their division in this letter is actually Paul himself. You had people within the church that were very much pro-Paul, they were his disciples, they loved Paul, they thought very highly of him, and then you had others that thought Paul was just a phony and a fake, and, and all his, this, this big story and everything that, that he claimed to have happened and, and who he claimed to be was just trying to uh, uh, get over numbers. And, 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 and he was trying to have this audience and his, and his followers, so they, they were against Paul. And what Paul is doing in the previous verses to this is he's basically uh, asking and, and pleading for the Corinthians to consider their conscience. In other words, who do you think that I am? I, I know who I am. I, Paul is saying, I, I'm settled with who God has called me to do. God, Jesus revealed himself to me. He gave me the I'm fine with that. I know that. That's, that's confirmed in my conscience. Now, do you think this is fake? That's what he's asking them. And so, so he's, he's pleading for unity, but he's doing so in a very humble way. He's not coming and, 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 and just putting himself out there and putting the other people down. He's actually, those that follow him, he's kind of giving them some ammunition. So that they can, they can kind of, he said, they actually boast in Paul. They have something that they're knowing that, that, of who Paul is, and they can, they can be assured of that. And so Paul is saying, if we are out of our minds, if we are acting crazy, if we are insane, then it's for God. If we are in our right minds, then it is for you. So, so how do we understand this? Again, there's a lot of discussion on what Paul exactly means, but here's what I want you to know. Here, here's the, the main idea. is this. If you are a follower of Christ, 
If you are putting the love of Christ in the driver's seat of your life, then there will be times when the world and even people within the church will think that you're crazy. Will think that you're insane. That you're doing outlandish things that don't make sense. And we've actually seen this in uh, the life of Christ himself. If you recall a couple months back, we were in Mark chapter 3. Maybe you remember what, what Christ's own family thought of him. Mark 3, 21 says this, And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. It's the same word here. They thought Jesus was crazy. They were embarrassed by him. If people thought that Jesus, the Son of God, was out of his mind, then they will think we also are out of our mind at times. Why? Because we are or should be living like Jesus lived. If the world thought Christ was crazy, they're going to think we're crazy. There will be times in our lives where God will call us to live in a manner that is absolutely crazy to the world. It makes no sense. But then there's also going to be times when we are called to, 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 to appear as sensible human beings. We're gentle, humble, and patient as we seek to love our neighbors. We're, we're respected by outsiders. That's, that's what it means that, that uh, if we're in our right mind, it's for you. We're caring for you. And I think in our time, we see two really good examples of this, right? As we have the coronavirus and it has been spreading across our nation, how do we as believers respond to that? Well, we respond very sensibly. We wash our hands. Uh, we, we, we practice, you know, social distancing protocols. At times we seclude ourselves in our, in our home. We, we do what the government has asked. We're not doing, they're not asking us to do anything outlandish. We, we, we live sensibly. Why are we doing that? Because it's for love for our neighbor. So we live in a sensible manner. But then there's also people out there whom God is going to call to uproot from their current existence, and he's going to call them overseas to a foreign land where, where their family is going to be exposed to other types of viruses and dangers to advance the gospel. For many people, a family that decides to do that and puts their family in danger, is they're going to think they're crazy, out of their mind, nonsensical. So you can see how at times we are called to, to live in both manners. But now let's turn our attention to verse 14 and the verses that follow. Because this, this is why, uh, the why for, for living this way. The why uh, that we, at times, we live crazy. Look what it says. It says, for the love of Christ controls us. Now, this is the driving kind of command of this text. We live for the love of Christ. We live according to the way in which Christ lived. We no longer live for ourselves. We value Christ above everything else in our life. In Christ, we have died to ourselves because he died for us and was raised for us so that we may then live for him. Once again, you see that the resurrection is at the center of who we are and of our purpose. Christ died and was raised so that we could, so that we would no longer live for ourselves. But with a new life that was purchased by the life of Christ, we would then live for Him. And a life that is lived for Him is a life that is controlled by Him. Our lives must be controlled by the love of Christ. And I think this is where we need to ask ourselves a question. Who or what is controlling my life? Who or what is controlling your life? I think if we're honest, there are many times when the love of Christ is not in the driver's seat of our lives. Instead, we live our lives controlled by other things in the world. We're controlled by, by fear. Maybe fear of our circumstances. 
We're making decisions based upon fear of what's going on in our lives. Maybe it's the fear of man. We're controlled by having a good reputation. We want, the, we want the, our friends and our neighbors to think highly of us. Maybe we're controlled by the love of money. We'll flesh that out a little bit more. Or we're controlled by wanting to have a financially secure future. And really what we're talking about here is what we value in life. What we see as most important in our life. Paul is saying the love of Christ needs to be the most important and most valued obsession in your life. So let me ask you a few questions. What does your involvement in church say about your value of Christ? I'm not talking about right now. Obviously we can't be that involved in church. But when things get back to normal, what, what does your involvement in church say about your value of Christ? What does the way you raise your kids say about your value of Christ? Are you raising them so that they would have a, a financially secure future and have a good job and be set up for the rest of their lives, their physical lives? Or are you raising them as disciples of Christ who, who seek first to advance the kingdom, who maybe go off onto the mission field. How about this one? What does your giving say about your value of Christ? Yes, I went there. What does your giving say about your value of Christ? I've heard a, a lot of pastors, and I've used this before, uh, say to find out where someone's value is, or what they are valuing in their life, what's most important in their life, you, you don't need to do anything other than look at their bank statement. What's their money going towards? If you're truly being controlled by the love of Christ, then you will be giving to the things that Jesus loves. You'll be giving to the mission of Christ. You'll be giving to the church of Christ. Now, now don't get me wrong. God does not need your money. God created the entire universe out of nothing. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. A, a God that is, that is in need of, of your money to, to fulfill what, what he wants to do is not a God that's worthy of our worship. God doesn't need squat from us. But your giving is a reflection of your love for or your value of Jesus. To be a sold-out follower of Christ means that everything that I own, everything that I am, I use and I leverage for His glory and for His mission. And the reason I want to emphasize money and giving is because money is one of, if not the greatest idol in our nation. And for many of us, we would be very foolish to think that at times it hasn't had its claws on our own hearts. It's been on my heart. We love our money. We love the comfort it brings us. We love the toys it buys us. And so we need to evaluate our hearts in the manner in which we hold on to our money. Or release our money. Are we holding our money with open hands before God, willing to give whatever amount He asks us? Or are we holding it with clenched fists, only willing to give Him the bare minimum? You can have 10% God, but the rest is mine. And, and I hope you know that, that, that the idea of a tithe, the 10%, it's not a New Testament principle. It's actually, it's not an Old Testament principle. People in the Old Testament are told to give over 20%. And here in just a couple minutes, we we're going to see the extent to, to which Christ gave his blood. Christ did not just tithe his blood, Right? I'm going to get 10% of my blood. I'm going to cover 10% of your sin. Now you, the rest you've got to cover yourself. No, all of it, all of the blood of Christ was poured out for us. We should then be willing to pour out our resources for the love of Christ. As Christians who seek to be led by the love of Christ, our lives should look 
a little bizarre to the world. Like Paul, there should be people who think we are out of our minds, we, have, we are crazy, and our giving should reflect this. I heard one pastor ask this question. When was the last time that your giving caused you to question your sanity? And for most of us, the answer is hardly ever. We just give what we think we're supposed to give so that we can check off that good Christian box. And so here's how we operate with God. We, we, we operate it in, in a way of, of like we give gift cards to somebody. I'm going to give you a $25 gift card to go to Chili's. I'm limiting you to $25 for that card. Anything over it, that's on you, right? That's how we treat God. We've got, God, I'm going to give you my 10%. Anything else, you've got to come up with. That's not how God asks us. That's, that's, that's not how he calls us to live. God wants us to write a blank check with our lives. Everything is his. He wants us to be willing to give up everything for him. Uh, several years back, I, I read a, an incredible book that, that really helped me think about this issue. And it's called The Treasure Principle. I highly recommend it. It's by a guy by the name of Randy Alcorn. I'm just helping the leaders think how they should give. Um, and, and, and let me just say this. I'm not saying this because, oh, uh, the church is needy and we need your money. We, we need you to give more. That, that's, not why, that's not my intent in saying this. I'm so convinced that giving needs to be a part of your life. That I said, look, if you don't, if you don't want to give to, to us or you don't trust us or whatever, that's fine. But you need to be giving somewhere. You need to be, be, be generously giving to the Great Commission and advancing the gospel somewhere in your life. That needs to be an attribute in your life. It doesn't have to be here. If you, you, you think that we're doing a good job of, of, of stewarding God's money and we're seeking to advance the gospel, then I invite you to do that. That's great. But, but if not, that's fine. Find some sort of avenue for you to be able to give. But in this book, Chevron, he gives several examples of families that just give uh, radical, that are radical examples of generosity. I just want to read to you a few of these. No, no, this is a very long first point. I've got four more. The other four are much shorter, okay? Uh, but, but he tells the story of Scott Lewis. Scott Lewis was the owner of Scott Machinery, and he attended a conference where, where Bill Bright, Bill Bright was the founder of, of Crusades, uh, where Bill Bright was uh, challenged people to give $1 million to help fulfill the Great Commission. This amount was laughable to Scott. Far beyond anything he could imagine, since his machinery business was generating an income of under $50,000 a year. Bill asked, how much did you give last year? Scott felt pretty good about his answer. We gave $17,000, about 35% of our income. Without blinking an eye, Bill responded, over the next year, why don't you make a goal of giving $50,000? Scott thought Bill had, had it understood. $50,000 was more than he'd made all year. But Scott and his wife decided to trust God with Bill's challenge, asking him to do the impossible. God provided in amazing ways with a miraculous December 31 provision, the Lewises were able to give the $50,000. The next year, they set a goal of giving $100,000. Again, God provided. Scott wrote me a note saying that in 2001, they passed the $1 million giving mark. The best part is they aren't stopping. That's what it means to excel at giving. Another story of Jerry and Muriel Cavan. After successfully establishing a restaurant chain, two banks, a ranch, farm, and real estate ventures, Jerry Cavan says that's when the real fun started. At age 59, I was headed into retirement looking for a nice lake home. Then God changed our plans and let Muriel and me to put our money and time overseas. It's been exciting. Before, we gave token amounts. Now, we put substantial money into missions. Our hearts are in another country now. We visit and minister there often. What changed the cabin's attitude toward giving? It was realizing God's ownership that got through to us. Once we understood we were giving away God's money to God's work, we had a peace and joy we never had back when we thought it was our money. After seeing the way poor Christians in other countries trust him, we've asked God if he wants to give away all of our money. He hasn't led us to do that, but we've meant it when we asked. 
He added, one of the big results of our giving is that we no longer hold things too close to our hearts. We can let them go, realizing they won't last, but we will. One last short story of Bob and Melinda Harvey. Bob and Melinda say, our life purpose for giving is as follows. Help fulfill the Great Commission by giving 50% of our annual income to Christian causes that have the greatest leverage. To do this, we must maximize our income, consult with people knowledgeable about ministry, and select the best organizations to support. We have average giving 33% for the last 15 years, and in the most recent two years, we have moved to 50% of our gross income. Now, why do I tell you these stories? These stories are nuts, right? Like, people in the world, and even Christians, would look at these people, at these families, what they're doing, and say, you're crazy, man. You're going to get 50% of your income. Your plan is to give 100% of what you are currently making annually away. That's not smart. They're out of their minds. But these people that we read about are people that are controlled by the love of Christ. They are putting the love of Christ in the driver's seat. They are entrusting everything they own in their lives to the Lord. And actually, that's not true. Because they don't own any of it. Everything they own is the Lord's. Everything that you think you own has been entrusted to you by God. You don't own squat. You are a steward of the Lord's gifts. And I love that, you know, you know the, 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 the gospel message begins with giving. For God so loved the world, what? That he gave his only son. That's what Jesus gave. Or that's, what, that's, what, that's what God the Father gave, his only son. He gave Jesus. And now he calls us to live our lives as a blank check. So may, may we be a people and may we be a church controlled by the love of Christ that stewards God's resources for his glory and his mission. Put the love of Christ in the driver's seat of your life. Secondly, second mission statement is this. We perceive the world through spiritual lenses. We perceive the world through spiritual lenses. Look at what it says in verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Here's what Paul is saying here. Physical conditions or or characteristics do not matter. They do not matter. For Paul, his primary uh, adversity or diversity that you see there was, was Jew and Gentile. They just didn't get along well. There's all sorts of, of issues in, that we see in the New Testament of these two groups of people not getting along. Paul said we can't look at people like Jew or Gentile. Uh, for us, in our, in our world, it's, it's white or black, rich or poor, old or young, Republican or Democrat, Sooner or cowboy, right? Those things do not matter in the least bit. As Christians, that is not how we should view the world. We need to view the world with spiritual lenses. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that, in a spiritual sense, there's two conditions in the world. There's lost and there's saved. That's all that matters. Uh, I heard this a story about the Titanic. Remember the Titanic? Have you seen the movie? And the Titanic was filled with people from all classes of society. Wealthy, high-class people, middle-class people, lower-class people that were snuck on. It was filled with this. And then what happened? The the Titanic, it sunk. And back in London, as as people are trying to figure out who's alive, who's not alive, they put up this big chalkboard with two categories. It didn't have high-class people over here, middle-class people over here, lower-class people over here. It said, saved or lost. That's it. That is how we need to see the world. When we think about people in our lives, we need to ask the question, are they in Christ? Are they a new creation? That's what matters. And listen, if if I am a Christian, 
that I have more in common and I have a closer identity to an Arabic man who has pledged his love for Christ than I do for an American citizen who has merely pledged his love to his country. The old way of viewing the world has passed away. In Christ, we are a new creation with a new identity. We have a new spiritual DNA. We are a new people. We're no longer lost. We're saved. That's how we need to view the world. Thirdly, thirdly, we provide people with the reconciliation of God. We provide people with the reconciliation of God. Look at verse 18. It says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. These are remarkable verses. First, we see that God has made reconciliation available through Christ. Now, that word reconciliation is Really a, a fancy word, if you, if you look it up on, on you know, dictionary.com, online, one of the definitions is, is the process of becoming compatible. Our people who are in opposition now come together. They were opposed to each other, and now they agree with each other. So, so in Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself. He's drawing people back to himself. He's making it so that we can be in a right relationship with him. So that we can be compatible with him. We were once enemies of God. And now in Christ, we can become friends of God. We can reconcile that relationship. And look what this text says. It says he's not counting our trespasses against us. He's wiping them clean. We have, we, have, we have this huge, long rap sheet, and God is erasing all of it. And in verse 21, he goes into a little more detail. If you, if you scroll down to verse 21, he says this, For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is how reconciliation takes place. This is what Martin Luther called the gray exchange. And we see pictures of this in the Old Testament. Uh, if you recall Jacob, or, or who became Israel, he had, he had all his sons, and, and at the end of his life, Joseph brings his two sons to his father, to Jacob, and he, and he has, the, has the older son on, on, on the right side of Jacob, and he has the younger son on the left side of Jacob. The right hand was the, the hand of, of promise, the hand of blessing. You remember what Jacob does? Jacob puts his right hand on the younger son. And the left hand, like this, he crosses over him. And, and Joseph's like, don't do this. And, and Jacob says, no, this is how it's going to be. He switched hands. Well, what we see at the cross when Christ died is be God switching his hands. We should have been on the right, or we should have been on, 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 on the side of cursing, on the, on the left hand of God, the, the, hand of, the hand of judgment. But instead, Christ takes our place and he takes upon the judgment that we deserve. And then we get the hand of blessing. We get to become the righteousness of of God, the Father's hand switched sides. And so through our faith in Jesus, we are then reconciled to God. We experience this exchange. But I love what verses 18 and 19 also tell us. In verse 18, it says that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In verse 19, it says that God has entrusted us with the message of reconciliation. Do you understand what these verses are saying? They are saying that we are a part of the means by which God is saving the world. We are part of the means by which God is saving the world. As we have been reconciled to God, we are now called to go out and declare this reconciliation to, the, to others. At Black Lives Matter, FBC, the ministry of reconciliation will always be the focus of everything we do. The reason we have a children's ministry and a youth ministry 
We have all these ministries that we want to be, see people reconciled to God. The reason we have a van ministry, the reason we do VBS and we decorate the stage and your pastor runs down the aisle like, like a crazy man is because we're wanting kids and youth and all kinds of people to come to hear the gospel and, and we're praying that they would be reconciled to God. We are actively involved in this ministry of reconciliation. Everything we do as a church is focused upon that. And listen, by, by implication of this, here's what these verses also mean. If we are not engaged in the ministry of reconciliation, if we are, if we are not going out with the message of reconciliation, then we have not truly experienced his reconciliation. And if our church is not actively involved in the ministry of reconciliation, then we're really not a church at all. We're just a social group that likes to get together and sing a few songs. And then we go out our own ways. Individually, if I'm not fulfilling the purpose for which, for which a group exists, then I am not a part of the group. And this idea is continued in the next point that I want us to see, point four, which is this. We portray Christ to the world. We portray Christ to the world. To the world. Look what it says in verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. So, so, so therefore, therefore, and, and, and Whenever you see therefore, you've got to see what it's there for. In light of, of this ministry of reconciliation, in light of us being reconciled and giving us this ministry, here's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. We're supposed to portray or represent Christ to the world. We have been saved to be sent. If we're not going, if we're not being sent out, then we're not saved. We have been brought out of darkness and into the light so that we can then go back out into the darkness with the light of Christ, advancing the kingdom of God in darkness. And then in verse 20, we see this other incredible phrase. It says, God is making his appeal through us. God wants people to come to a saving knowledge of his son. God wants to advance his kingdom, and he's going to do it. But the way that he's going to do it is by using his people, by using the church, by using us. And if you are a believer, I believe that, that this idea should maybe at first terrify you, right? Like, 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 we're the, we're the way in which God is advancing his kingdom. I think, man, I'm really failing in this, so I guess I'm, I guess God's failing now. So, so you, maybe you're, you're terrified at first, but then I think if you, when you think and you med meditate a little bit more, this should encourage you. If you are truly a believer in Christ, God is going to use you. He's going to empower you. Next week, we're going to look at, at the power of uh, resurrection power. We see that he's given us the spirit to live and move within our midst. He's going to use us. He's going to use this church. So what does this then look like? What does it mean to portray Christ to the world? What does it mean to, to be engaged in the ministry of reconciliation, to be these ambassadors? Well, it's this. This is point five, the last thing. We plead for people to come to Christ. We plead for people to come to Christ. Look what it says there, end of verse 20. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That, that word implore means to ask or, or to beg. We beg the world to be reconciled to God. We beg the world to experience the, the great exchange of, of becoming the righteousness of Christ, of believing in Christ who took our sins upon himself. Are you engaged in pleading and begging for people to be reconciled to God? Or are we begging people to take part in that great exchange? To put their faith in Christ who bore their sins so that they might receive 
his righteousness. That is our resurrection purpose. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Where we're, we're living our lives controlled by the love of Christ. And, and Christ's love has given us this, this daunting task of the ministry of reconciliation. He's made us his ambassadors. And that looks like now for us pleading for people to come to Christ. Telling them that judgment is coming. That Christ will return. If we're not found in Christ, we are damned for all eternity. We're pleading people to understand this and to know this. This is our resurrection purpose. Are you living that purpose? Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for your word. Lord, oftentimes your word brings incredible conviction upon our hearts and upon our lives when we reflect on our lives and we realize that we are not living in light of our purpose very well. When we're living, we're, we're allowing things of the world to control us. We're allowing our, our love for money or our love for security or, or for hobbies or whatever it may be. We're allowing those things to control our lives. We're putting those things in the driver's seat. Father, help us to repent of that. Help us to reject our old life we would live in light of the fact that we are new creations with a, with, a, with a new identity and a new purpose. Lord, help us to be bold ambassadors. Lord, convict us to, to, to plead for people to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. We thank you for the work that you are doing for the lives that you are changing, for how you are advancing your kingdom. God, we pray that, that we can just be a part of that. Lord, that we get to just, just witness and see your incredible power. Help us, Father. This morning, if, if you are out there and you joined us, and maybe you're hearing these things and you've come to a realization that you have not been reconciled to God, that you are still an enemy of God. That if you were, you were to, to walk out of your house and, and get hit by a bus, then right now you would be standing before the judgment seat of Christ. And you'd be standing there with only your, your own actions to defend you. And those actions would send you straight to hell. So I'm pleading with you this morning to be reconciled to God. How do you do that? It's simple. You put your faith in Christ and Christ alone for your salvation. You repent of your rebellion. You repent of your pride and, and your thinking and that you can earn a right standing before God. You repent of that and you turn and trust Christ alone for your salvation and for your hope. I plead with you to do that this morning. If you need to talk, or you need to know more of what this looks like, or, or, or flesh out the gospel even more, then send us a message. Send me a message. We'd love to visit with you. But there's, a, there's an incredible response for, for believers this morning. You're a believer, then you are an ambassador for Christ. So the question you need to ask yourself is, how well are you representing Christ? Do you have Christ? Do you have the love of Christ, the love for Christ in the driver's seat? Is that what is, is, is fueling you, your love for Christ? And how does that, that look like for your giving? 
How's that look like for, for, for what you are treasuring, what you are valuing in your life? There's a lot of ways for you to respond this morning. One, one is just simple, of, of, of engaging more in the mission. Of identifying people in your life that you know that they need to hear the gospel. And you need to go out and you need to plead with them to come to know Christ. Maybe for some of you, you need to evaluate and understand that, yeah, money has been an idol in my heart. I've been grasping, I've been holding on to that. that that's really the priority in my life. And I need to release that. And I don't know what that looks like. Maybe you give it to the church. Maybe you find a missionary family to support. Maybe you have you know some great cause of, of, of a group that's advancing the kingdom, the International Mission Board, the North American Mission Board. I don't know what it is or what it looks like. But you need to know, you need to express the value that, have, that you have for Christ because you know deep down inside that you have not expressed that very well. That's an invitation to believers. Let their giving, let everything that they have in their life, let, 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 let everything of, of who they are show their value and love for Christ. And Christ is first and foremost. And you are representing Him to the world, to a lost and dying world. Let's sing this morning one last song as we close. Thank you.